up beyond the sharp wave crashes, the joyful early morning splashes of mermaid bathers, past the shunt and growl of shingle removal vans on the shifting beach, I mount towards Seaford Head. Vertigo ripples in me as I tread upward over Lynchet, the turf escalator of deep furrowed lines and ridges, feeling the ancestral heat of early human ascent and arrival, of their collective sweat, breath and labour, of the hauling of animals, children, wood and metal, harnessing the power of sheer height to find a stable footing. I bring the words of the softly spoken archaeologist with me. If you can imagine where the creamy tides along here now rush to greet you, lay a vast stretch of land, its belly dense with pine, birch, oak, hazel and elm. Early peoples from Europe and the Middle East with their white, brown, black and olive, weather-worn hands and feet, new tools and sheep, shaved and shaped these downs into their signature rolling curves. The beach and town below has always been in a tussle with the far greater power of the tides. Medieval shingle bars holding back ships between sea and estuary, Elizabethan storms expelling humps of beach mass along the coast, Victorian industrial age spectacles of cliff explosions dismissed by a bemused sea with a flick of its watery wrist. The town flooded and wept as the river that had shaped this once vibrant port of ships, fish, wine and wool was lightly recut into New Haven. Fortunes rose and fell and Seaford sank into quieter slumber. This flat tip of chalky grassland is wildlife reserve, golf course, and through route to the fisheye vantage point of the entire Seven Sisters, white rolls and licks with Coast Guard cottages nestled below. This land is also a complex, evolving archive. At this far edge of the Anthropocene and climate emergency, through summer scorch and winter storm, these cliffs are unmaking themselves more swiftly, their chalk chests flaking into milky surf. Quivering from recent and dramatic depletion, more vulnerable now than ever. Kitty wakes, peregrines, ravens and gulls have kept watch over this sliding edge, seeing the once buried traces of a vast human settlement re-emerge through the chalk and flint lines. I long for wings to swoop in and see for myself, but landbound, I use instead the archaeologists' digital drone feeds to help grasp what we've lost that we haven't even known we've lost across time, space, and into the expanding sea channel. The aerial lens shows so many gaps and hollows across a spectrum of white, ivy green and terracotta, the trace of former valleys sandwiching earthworks amidst the jagged cliffside of chalk, the occasional linear wobbles of brick red and leak lines of rusted ochre. Laced and dotted across the image, traces of field systems and passing humans like me wink back as tiny smudges. Waves in mid-flight tease the cliff to come closer and offer them just a little more. This freeze frame is witness to the shock of irreversible loss. Yet, to the archaeologists, it's also fruitful, offering juice for their quiet, speculative excitement. Remains of Victorian excavation are now at rest in the sea. Others are following fast behind them like keen children. I try to relate this through my body. Is it like a dream where you wake up to find part of yourself simply gone? Your hip perhaps, or your thigh, clumps of hair or layers of skin without warning? Is this land still trying to remember what it once was as it continually releases its outer limbs and nerve endings through the chalk drops? What shape is the land's memory? What can it teach us about the flow and ebb of human life here over centuries of those who thrived, fought, loved, buried and revered their dead and drew their own last breaths here? We speculate the archaeologist tells me, from within a mist of possibilities, as we search for material evidence, fragments of urns and burnt bones evoking rite and ritual, connect us intimately to a downland once shaped into fruitful harvest. Flints found were perhaps 
objects for blood ceremonies or used to skin animals for feasting or were arrows flitting through salty air in defence or attack. I strain to see so clearly what they see, how details of bumps and scratches on the maps and land grow into holographic images within their expert imaginations. The archaeologist passes me a pair of deep time lenses and I wonder further, perception altered following dotted lines to the pleasing word tumuli, sacred burial site. Now an oval sand bunker where clean white golf balls drop. Placing my palms into the surrounding earth, ear to the ground, I feel the vibration of a thousand footsteps, whispers, kisses, libations of sacred communion with seed, harvest, sun and moon. And further on, amidst the twist and sway of golfing green, a long, low, grassy mound, a Bronze Age barrow, I am told, rises, early focal point of great power and ancestry, moonlighting as golfing feature. These formations once inspired and shaped what came next, one civilization leaving clues for the other. A layer cake, a palimpsest. The word itself sounds like a game between ancestors played over millennia shifting direction through migrations forced by climate breakdown, conflict or other time-lost reasons. How did the land feel about being claimed and divided, exhausted and depleted with each cycle of occupation? Had it become restless and, in collaboration with the elements, begun to shake off all human claims to its riches and solidity? Perhaps for a thousand years after the Bronze Age it lay fallow, in the hollow silence of wind and human abandon. With iron came the sharper edges, boundaries and walls, wooden stakes hammered into ditches to raise a palisade twice my height. Weaponry gave everyone the means to defend, to dance with violence and social strata. Human elites emerged, division and power struggles transformed this once sacred hilltop into a fort, punching skywards visible for miles. From this highest point, it was proclaimed, look, we stand on the place of our ancestors. We reclaim this land. Our bones are here. We belong. This is our citadel. And these are our weapons. Do bones belonging make, I asked myself, on an island of such long-standing refuge and resettlement? My lenses are multi-sensory. I smell fires and meat roasting, hear blades sharpening, inhale the dark sweat of survival through storm and wind. The thud of gates barricading as the approaching lights of vessels are spotted out at sea. I follow paths through gorse fetch and hawthorn, glimpse the blue hem of a woman's robe around a corner, carrying water up from the springs below, birthing her child into the soil blood clots enriching earth as she glimpses the cool and balancing horizon line of the sea ahead. Through treasures found, corroded horseshoe and glint of coin, alongside shaped flint and lime kiln, time compresses and expands. To Roman Britain, medieval era and beyond. And with it, cycles of violence bringing colonial shipwreck plunder, quicksilver and almonds, opium, lace and oil, sunk and salvaged to puncture the desolation of coastal poverty. Flame and blackening smoke in pitch pots plumed from giant beacons on sight of the Spanish Armada. The high wooden fort long abandoned and sunk into earth, replaced by brick and concrete. Watch houses, signal stations and coast guard lookouts, all blinking gold and white in the inky dark of storms. The high adrenal shouts of World War I and II encampments, Soldiers in khaki and olive, boots and spades crisscrossing paths, earth splitting into practice trenches. The occasional quiet, seized moment of rolling tobacco or writing home to beloveds inland or across the Commonwealth. Too many boys rehearsing their entry into future fields of trauma and inevitable loss. All along this coast, through threatened wartime border and hostile environment, Eyes once and still keep watch on the tidal taunt and sweep of separation, denying the hopes and dreams of skin-to-skin -skin reunion. The archaeologists call this place a scheduled monument. This implies that things are under control, on a set timeline. 
We all know now that we're ahead of schedule. That's the rub. Slowly nudged inland by the persistent movement of land that has not been cared for, listened to, or supported enough to slow down its own erasure. Within decades, how many we are still unsure, the archaeologist adds, this coastal path, the golf course, and all the dwellings along this outer edge will become phantom contours. No more. This loss is scheduled by forces far more powerful than us. Unlike earth inland or life below the water, chalk can't regrow or rewild. This is a full stop. Is this a ripe moment to bear witness and bow to what remains? To capture the traces of our richly mixed ancestries and heritage, blended over centuries of arrival, reunion and adaptation? Are we not all living monuments to our own shared hopes, dreams, resistances and actions, part of a future layer in this palimpsest? Before I leave, I feel the urge to gift a part of my own body here, a slice of nail perhaps, a drop of blood or a single hair from my head. But all I really have to offer are these words and questions, rising and falling into the tremble of surf as the tide draws in to embrace and claim its next of kin.